more church when you stand. Let's sing this together. I'll praise. Praise in the valley. I praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure. I praise when I'm doubting. I praise when I'm numb. Praise when surrounded Cause praise is the water My enemies drown in As long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to praise The Lord of oh my soul
We're going to put our hands together, church. Here we go. Amen. We're so thankful that we serve a God who we can look to, we can rely on through anything that comes our way in our lives. God who fights for us, who is, goes before us in our battles. The Bible says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Sometimes that's the, that's the, the temptation is to wrestle against our brothers and sisters, against people. But that is truly not what we're fighting against. We're fighting against the, 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 the devil, the evil one who comes to steal and kill and destroy, who clouds the minds of people. And so when we talk about fighting battles, when God fights our battles for us, he's going before us, opening eyes and giving, bringing truth and light into those who will submit to his authority. Amen? And let us be those people. And then let us be those who would spread that light into a world that so desperately needs it. Do you believe that? Amen. Well, hey, we are so glad that you're here this morning. We're going to do some more worship together. Kids, you're dismissed to Kids Point at this time, and everybody else, why don't you take a moment and greet those who are around you, and then we'll continue with our time of worship. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we want to welcome you to Life Point. You can go ahead and find your seat right now. And I uh, just want to say what a great morning already as we've been worshiping together. And uh, I hope that uh, right now you're just expecting great things because we know that God is right here in our midst, accepting our praise and worship. And so as we start off this day, uh, boy, can we just say amen that God has given us such a beautiful weekend? And if you love summer, then this is going to be a great week for you coming up here. It looks like we got just uh, another beautiful week to enjoy God's great creation. Well, hey, we also want to take a moment and thank uh, all those that are online uh, for joining in with us this morning and extend a very warm welcome to you. Uh, so good to have you with us today. Um, hey, we want to ask you right now, if you would take a moment and grab a Connect card, you can find that in the seat back in front of you. If you're joining us online today, you can find that on our website, also on our LifePoint app. And just let us know uh, about your visit so we could have a record of that. But no, it's also a great way just that you could communicate 
to us as a church, as a staff, uh, anything that might be on your heart. Um, we have life groups starting up. Uh, Pastor Adam's going to talk about that later. Uh, a lot of things with ministry coming up as well. So it's a great way to let us know what you'd love to get more information on and then how you'd love to be involved, whether it's in a small group. Maybe it's serving here at LifePoint. Uh, maybe you have a prayer request that you'd like to let us know about. So in all those things, uh, fill that out on the Connect card, and then you'll find that you can drop that uh, right in the back. Uh, we have a give box in the sanctuary, also one out in the hallway. And uh, when the service is completed, you can just go ahead and drop those in there. And if you have any tithes or offerings for our LifePoint family this morning that you brought, uh, that would be a great spot to drop those in. Or as well, we have giving available um, online if that is a more convenient option for you. A uh, couple things we just want to let you know as we're, uh, as we're gearing up for this morning and, and continuing in our worship service is that uh, our missionary of the week we're going to be lifting up in prayer is the Tika family. And uh, if you know them, they are serving at the uh, International Graduate School of Leadership in the Philippines. And they are raising up church leaders and church planters from all over the world to go back to their countries and to reach, uh, reach their areas, plant churches, and, and see uh, God's kingdom advance. Uh, so be praying for them. Uh, at the end of the service, Pastor Adam will have more announcements for you. But let's do this. As we're continuing in our time, as we're, as we're right now just coming before the Lord, I just want you to take a second and, and quiet your hearts, and let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Would you pray with me? Our precious Heavenly Father, this morning, Lord, we just are overjoyed with, with the praise uh, Lord, with, with the opportunity, Lord, to worship together with this body of believers, Lord, your church, of which you are the head. And you've called us, Lord, to a task in this world to make your name known, make much of your name. So today, Father, as, as we lift our hearts and our, and our uh, voices, Lord, in worship, Lord, we know that you are right here in our midst. And Father, we're coming expecting that you will move, Lord, in a great way in our hearts, in our lives, and around this city, Lord, around this world. Today, Father, we, uh, we do want to remember, Lord, there are so many names and lives that are on our prayer sheet today. But Lord, we do want to pray for Amanda's sister-in-law. Uh, Lord, some health concerns as, as she is expecting right now. Father, we do pray for your hand to be on uh, Lord, both the, uh, the mother and the little one, Lord, that is yet to be born, that you would grant them the health, Lord. Father, we want to pray for Mary's nephew, Brad, as he moved to um, a facility, Lord, but uh, passed on Friday morning. Lord, we want to pray your peace and your comfort, Lord, over this family. Lord, there's so many times each and every day that we recognize, Lord, how much we need you guiding us, Lord, leading us, strengthening us, Lord, for all the tasks, everything that you've called us to. Lord, we are thankful that your love never fails us. We're thankful, Lord, that you never change. In the midst of each situation, Father, you're always there with us. So, Father, in all things, let us rely in a greater and greater way, Father, in you. Not try to carry out the things of this world, Lord, in our own strength. But Lord, we want to see the ministries here, Lord, through small groups, through serving, through outreach into this community, Father. We want to see your name be made much of, Lord. Let that be our heartbeat this morning. And in all things, Lord, in this service, let us just surrender our lives more that you can work more wholly and fully in us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us and continue to worship? What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound 
to his oh how strange and divine i can sing all is mine yet not i but through christ sing this together. You give life. You give life. You are love. 
You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Yeah. You give life, you are love. a great God. Let's lift it up and praise Him. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. You only it's your breath in our lungs. So we That song so simple but so profound that it's the breath in our lungs that even allows us to give praise to the Lord. When I first heard that song, I was like, eh, not sure I think it really means that much, but then I thought of the fact that when we sing, we, we have to use breath to even, um, to even make sound, and uh, some of us are making a, 
a good sound, and some of us are making a joyful sound, and, and uh, many of you love to tell me where you fall on that spectrum. But you know what? The fact that we need God for everything, even the very breath in our lungs, the heartbeat that keeps our, our blood pumping through our body, that's not up to us. Many of you know that life is short and health is not guaranteed. You also know that uh, relationships are not something we can take for granted. We, we know that there are hardships, financial, health, you name it. And so the song that we sang this morning, that we lifted up together, we said that it's not through our strength, but through Christ in us. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. So as we enter into a new school year, into a new cycle of a new season, as a church, we need him. We fix our eyes on him, not on ourselves, not on anything that we can do. We're just not clever enough. We're not intelligent enough. All the knowledge we think we have about God's word, it pales in comparison to our holy matchless king so we look to him we open our arms we open our hearts to him and we say god we need you direct us guide us don't let us step outside of what you want to accomplish through us so let's sing this together lord i need you oh i need you the one who sustains us, who created us, who loves us, who knows us intimately better than we even know ourselves. That's not just a cliche, that's true. You formed us. So God, today we give ourselves to you. Man, it's just so crazy how many things vie for our attention and affection. And Lord, we're faced with messages everywhere in our world. And God, we just pray because we can't do it on our own. We need you. We need you to focus our minds on our Savior, the one who has created us and set us free and gives us hope. God, give us your strength. Father, now as we open your word, we realize you've given us the roadmap and we have been given the words that lead to life. And may we be obedient to hear, but then to do it. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. You know, before we start this morning, I just want to take a moment and say how grateful I am for the teams that we have serving here at LifePoint. Uh, and just a quick example of that this morning, if you joined us online, uh, there was no audio this morning for the first couple songs because we had a piece of equipment that failed. And our tech team was able to do a quick workaround right back there. We were hustling, and, and uh, they were able to get it back up and running. So I'm just so thankful for working with teams uh, that are very uh, dedicated to all that they're doing. And thank you guys for uh, getting us back up and running. And uh, we will plan to post the entire video later on the website as well, just so we can get uh, the, the whole service. But uh, 
Uh, I, I just am so blessed. Uh, all those that are serving and dedicated and working here, using their gifts and talents for the Lord, uh, it's, it's incredible to be part of a ministry like that. Well, I'm, I'm glad to be back with you as we continue on a series that we started uh, some months ago on the life of Joseph. And, uh, you know, because it's been, um, it's been a minute since we've been in this uh, story and been in this book, I thought it'd be good for you, uh, just for all of us, really, to, to have a quick recap. You know, it's almost like if you ever watch a series like on, on, on a streaming device and they go to show you the next episode, and it's like, here's a recap of what happened last week, you know? We definitely need that. So as the story of Joseph uh, unfolded, Joseph was a young man that was shaped by a dream, right? And this idea was that one day he was going to lead. And, and this is a young man that was faced with all kinds of challenges, you know, more than anyone else. And uh, probably at some point we wonder if he ever wished he had not had these dreams because he went from being his father's favorite son, right, to being sold into slavery. Now, I came across uh, this picture. I want to I want to show you this picture on the screen here. Uh, this week, you can see it's this guy stepping, uh, missing all these steps and stepping up to the very top. And and I love this because uh, in the story of Joseph, right at the bottom, telling Joseph to stop saying he's better than you. The next step up, maybe we should just steal his coat. The next step up. Hey, let's tell our, our dad that his favoritism, making Joseph is, is the favorite guy. Or the very top step, let's sell Joseph into slavery. There were so many steps along the way that were missed, right? His brothers just went straight to the top. They're like, you know what? Let's just get rid of this kid. And so what they did is they sold him into slavery. And then he gets, travel, or he gets uh, taken to Egypt, and he's sold into to the house of Potiphar, and, and he's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. And so what happens next, right? He's thrown into the dungeon. But then he's, he's doing such an incredible job there that they make him in charge of the dungeon, and, and he uh, goes ahead and helps out these guys with their dreams, and, and the one that is restored to his position for the Pharaoh says, I'm going to remember you, and he doesn't, and Joseph is left in the dungeon. And our last time, we see how Joseph was then able to uh, go ahead and interpret the dream for the Pharaoh, and then the Pharaoh makes him second in command. So this is a young man where his life always was like two steps forward, right? Three steps back. But what we're going to see today is that Joseph's dream has now come to fruition. It's not been an easy journey, but he's got this new position under Pharaoh, he is second in command over all of Egypt. Now, I'll tell you, if you go from a position of being a slave and being a prisoner to now being second in command, I mean, he had the world at his fingertips. He had a checkbook that just didn't run out. Joseph could do whatever he wanted to do. You know what's amazing about this? And, and, and this, is a, this is a young man. When we first met Joseph, he was 17 years old. He's now 30. He's the second most powerful person in Egypt. I, there's this quote from J. Oswald Sanders that says this, very few men can hold this full of a cup and do it well. Because here's what happens oftentimes. Great success, great wealth, what does that often do to people? It brings a crippling pride. It can quickly ruin a person. You know, it's interesting in, in today's uh, world to think about hap what happens. I, I, I read some statistics. They're actually very staggering about people who win the lottery. The statistic says that one-third of people who win the lottery go broke. One-third. They are more likely to declare bankruptcy within three to five years than the average American. Immediately coming upon some type of an, a tremendous blessing, a great wealth, for many people, that ruins them. And so going back to this quote, very few men can hold this full of a cup and do it well. Joseph went from slave to second in command in Egypt. You know, a lot of times, um, it's not even just financial gain that can be a challenge in people's lives. You know, maybe there's goals that you had set in your own life. Maybe uh, it was to reach a certain promotion at work. Uh, maybe it was to graduate with a certain degree and, and you reach that status. 
You can become very successful in your career, but you know what can sometimes happen? You reach that status at work, and that doesn't translate to the personal life that you now have at home because of what it took to get to that place. Sometimes, you know, you hear people talk, man, I, I love work, and, and I just, I hate coming home because everyone loves me at work, and I get home, and I don't get that same kind of love. You know, I think there's a good principle here that we don't pour so much of ourselves into the things that we're doing that it causes ruin in the relationships that we have. Make sure, no matter what it is that God has called you to do, whether it is ministry, full-time, whether it is working in a, in a job, a teaching, uh, a doctor, whatever it could be, whatever vocational role God has placed you in, make sure that you save some for home. That when you get home, you have energy now to be investing into the very first ministry that God has given to you, into your spouse, into your family. So Joseph, we see that he has um, all kinds of great things happen vocationally, but now we're going to start uh, looking into, well, what's happening in his personal life as we continue this story? There's a lot of scripture this morning. I just want to warn you, not all of it's on your notes this morning. Uh, we tried to put as much on there as we could. Uh, you can follow along on screen, uh, also in your Bibles. But we're going to start in Genesis 41, verses 50 to 52. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenoph, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, it is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. So Joseph, as we have already mentioned, right, he has the success of a great career. He has this high position. And yet, he, for many years, has experienced the extreme brokenness of his family. But with God's help, he's putting these things behind him. So his sons, right, the two sons, uh, the first one, Manasseh, means forgetful. God has made me forget all my trouble and all of my father's household. It's interesting, if you go back into the original language there in the Old Testament, that word, my trouble, that is, is, is it's really referring to Joseph's sorrow broadly, uh, but it's the same term that is later used in scripture uh, to describe the affliction of the Hebrew slaves in Egypt. So when you think about all the trouble that Joseph said, God made me forget, it's that same term to describe all the affliction of the, uh, of the Hebrew slaves. His second son, Ephraim, God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. His name actually means twice fruitful or doubly fruitful. So Joseph realizes that even though I'm in this land where I've gone through suffering, sorrow, tribulation, more, more problems than most of us will ever face, he says, God is blessing me richly. And I love this, you know, uh, it, it, it's really a beautiful picture of what we see later in the New Testament in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it, which simply says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You know, another, another version of the scripture would say God works together uh, for the good. And, and I love those two words there because in the Greek, the, the term that, that means work together, that, ter that term is soon ergeo. And what that is, is a term that's taking two very bad things and bringing them together. The word that we get from, uh, from our modern day English language from that word is synergy. God takes these things that don't seem like they should fit together or work together and somehow he brings them together for this beautiful synergy that now works in your life because he's gonna use it for your good. So we don't know how long Joseph struggled with the pain of his past. I mean, his brothers were gonna kill him and then they decided to sell him off as a slave. I, I have no idea how long that was just kind of rolling in his mind. This is my family. This is what they did to me. We know that he had to learn to deal with his past in healthy ways. Uh, you know, for us today, what, what would that look like? 
You know, back then, Joseph wouldn't have been able to go to a, a biblical counselor or, or a godly mentor and talk about these things. But there are so many times today when we have things that are hanging around in our past that are just, they're, they're like a big weight on us. And those are the times that we need to turn to God's word and oftentimes uh, to somebody who can, who can provide that biblical counseling, that godly mentoring. And I love that Joseph, through this all, he takes the attitude uh, of Paul, which is later seen in Philippians chapter three. You guys remember this passage where it says, forgetting what is behind, I press on toward the goal to win the prize. You know, we all have things that want to pop up in our past. And those things can either paralyze us or we can, we can do exactly what Paul said. I'm going to put those things behind and I'm going to press on towards the prize, towards the goal. I believe that Joseph here is one who still longs for the restoration of his family. And we're going to see that unfold as we continue in this story. So going now to verse 53 of Genesis 41, the seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had said. There was famine in all the other lands, but in the whole land of Egypt there was food. When all Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh for food. Then Pharaoh told all the Egyptians, go to Joseph and do what he tells you. So we know that there were seven years of plenty. So Joseph has been in his position now for seven years as the second in command. Isn't it amazing just to stop here for a minute and, and think uh, about where Joseph is mentally? And, and here's what I mean. Actually, let's do this. Let's look at verses 56 and 57, and then let's, let's talk about this for a second. When the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. And all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere. So Joseph's really, his first thing is, is just preparing Egypt, preparing the world really for what he knew, what God laid on his heart was coming. Seven years of plenty, and then seven years of famine. So for his first order as second in command is to take care of Egypt and all of these other people around him. Now imagine, if you were placed in second in command, what, what might we be tempted to do with our very first order, you know, being that high up on the totem pole? Because, you know, Joseph, uh, he could have easily brought out Potiphar and his wife, who falsely accused him and got him thrown into prison. He could have brought out that butler, right, that dude that totally forgot him and left him in prison for another couple years. He could have brought all these guys out, and he could have had them hung. He could have easily done that. But that's not where Joseph's mind went. That is not what he decided to do. Joseph was not about payback. He wasn't about being petty. You know, it brings me to a key thought for this morning. Let God handle the problem people in your life. If you want to defend yourself, God will let you, but the Lord is going to give you a far better defense than you could ever do for yourself. Instead of trying to take care of those people that had done him extremely wrong, Joseph was like, you know what? I'm going to let God handle that. We need to do the same thing. There's another part of scripture, right? Vengeance is mine, right? Saith the Lord. Now we're going to jump into Genesis 42, continuing this story, starting in verse 1. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. We don't know exactly how long this was, but obviously long enough that uh, Jacob is getting a little annoyed that his boys are just kind of sitting around looking at each other like, what are we going to do? Like, nothing's happening. He said, look, I know, I heard there's grain in Egypt. Go on down there and, and buy some. So verse 3, then 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come against him. We're getting a little bit of a picture right here into the family dynamic 
Uh, you know, as, as we all remember from, from the very first week, right, Joseph had the coat of many colors because he was Jacob's favorite son. And that didn't go well for Joseph, right? His brothers were extremely upset with him, and they didn't understand why that was happening. So the second favorite, now that Joseph is out of the picture, they believe that he's dead or gone or whatever. Now that he's out of the picture, Benjamin is the second favorite because he's the only other son of Rachel. So Ben is favored. But you know what's interesting? Whereas Jacob used to let Joseph go out and go into the fields and check on his brothers and do all these things, he's not doing that now with Benjamin. He's already lost one son. So Benjamin, he's holding him close. He's not letting him go anywhere. And, and when these brothers made this trip to Egypt, it was probably roughly 200 to 250 mile trip. It probably would have taken them six weeks round trip to go to Egypt, get everything, and then come back. It was no small task. Let's skip down to verse six. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold all the grain to its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he pretended to be a stranger, and he spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. And although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. You know, it's been 21 years at this point since they sold him into slavery as a 17-year-old teenager. It's been 21 years. He's grown a lot. And since he was one of the youngest, he's changed a lot more than his older brothers would have changed. But you know, the other part is, now he wouldn't, he wouldn't look like a Hebrew man. He would look like an Egyptian. You know, his head would be completely shaved. Uh, he would have that cool little goatee thing that they did. Uh, he would even speak like an Egyptian. So as he was talking to them, there would be a translator by his side. So they didn't even think that they, that they could understand or that he could understand what they were saying. And so Joseph speaks roughly to them. Why? Because he wants to test them and see where his brothers are at now. It's been a long time since they sold him into slavery. Let's see where they're at. Verse 9. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. I love this. Joseph remembers his dream. You remember what happened in Joseph's dream? He saw his brothers doing what? Bowing down to him. Whoa, this just got really real, didn't it? Like, Bing, I remember this. You know, it was a protocol back then. This would be a normal thing. It was a protocol uh, to be suspicious of foreigners. When other people come into your land, especially when you're the only uh, area that has food that can distribute it to other people, they're going to be very cautious, very suspicious about what's going on. Not just that these guys are a little sus. You know, they're his brothers. They would have expected... They would have expected to be suspicious about anybody coming in. Are we feeding some of our enemies who are going to attack us next week? And I love this. I love that the brothers come out to Joseph and say, no, 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 we are honest men. Now, I don't know about you, but selling your brother into slavery doesn't usually like mark that badge that you can sew on your shirt that says, I'm an honest person. Joseph was probably having to like, choke back some of his laughter. It's like, no, 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 we are honest men. And, and he's probably laughing inside. Let's continue in verse 13. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father and one is no more. Who's that? Joseph. Joseph said to them, it is just as I told you, you are spies, and this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Now let me pause for a second. Joseph said, as surely as Pharaoh lives. He's saying, okay, I'm saying that on the life of Pharaoh, here's what's going to happen. Do you know why he didn't say 
uh, on, on God. He didn't you know, give a, a promise in that way. He didn't want his brothers to know that he believed in God. That would have been like an indicator like, wait a minute, what? You know about God? You're an Egyptian? What's going on here? But what happens right here is Joseph is opening a wound from the past to see how his brothers will react. And so what does he do? He puts his brothers in custody for three days, and then skipping down to verse 18, it says that on the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live, for I fear God. Oh, he just gave them a little hint. They didn't catch it, but he gave them a little hint. Then he says in 19, if you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. Now, we, can't, we don't have time to go through every little part of the story, but you know who stays behind? It's not the oldest brother, Reuben. It's number two, Simeon. Do you know why? It's because when they, all the brothers were like, hey, let's kill Joseph. Let's sell him into slavery. Reuben was like, no, that is not happening. We are not doing this. Don't do this. But the number two brother, when Reuben wasn't there, he kind of took charge, right, and said, guys, let's do this. This is happening. So Simeon is the one who's going to stay in prison. And then if you were to read through verse 21 to 24, and I'd encourage you to do that, just continue to read through this story on your own. What happens uh, is that the brothers are talking amongst each other, right? They're talking amongst each other. They don't realize that Joseph can understand their language. And what they're saying to each other is we're being punished because of what we did to Joseph. He was distressed. He pleaded for his life, and we didn't listen And Reuben replied, as they're having this conversation, Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, meaning Joseph? And he says, now we must give an account for his blood. Because they were assuming that Joseph might have just been dead at that point. We must give an account for his blood. And you know what happens in verse 24? Joseph goes off and he weeps. Because he hears the conversation that's going on between his brothers You know what? Key thought. Forgiveness is emotional. Joseph is going to experience throughout this story, we're getting into the really good sections here, he's going to experience all kinds of emotions. Six times in this story, Joseph goes off and he weeps. His brothers basically right in front of him just admitted their guilt. And you know what? That's the first step in healing. That's the first step in uh, reconciliation, is for us to say, uh, God, I'm agreeing with you that my thoughts, that my actions, that my words were sinful. To admit that is the first step that needs to happen. Scripture says what? Confess your sins and you will be healed, right? Why is it that God, if God already knows our hearts and he knows all of our thoughts, and, and even inside, maybe he knows that we are, uh, you know, sorry for those things that we've done. Why is it that God wants us to still confess that? Because it's good for us to say it out loud. He wants to hear that we are saying, yes, I agree that what I did was wrong. It was against your perfect standard. It was sinful. The brothers are dealing with this guilt. Now, keep in mind, 21 years later, these brothers are dealing with this same guilt uh, over this entire period of time. They've been carrying this guilt like a heavy backpack for 21 years. It's still plaguing them. Sin causes you to hold on to guilt. When it's left unconfessed, when it's not taken care of before God, sin will cause you to hold on to that guilt, and that's exactly what's happened with these brothers. Now, we're going to skip down quite a ways here to to verse 25 as we continue in Genesis 42. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in his sack, and to give them provisions for their journey. After this was done for them, they loaded their grain on their donkeys, and they left. At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his silver in the mouth of his sack. 
My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank, and they turned to each other, trembling, and said, What is this that God has done to us? Here's what happened. Joseph gave their money back. They didn't know that. Joseph gave their money back. What does that mean? Most likely, he paid for their grain, their food, out of his own pocket. He said, here it is. I'm going to pay for it. You put their silver back in. Why would Joseph do that? Because he knew that they're going to need that money for the next trip. He didn't know exactly where they stood, or maybe this was everything they had to come and travel this this big uh, journey to come here and to buy food and bring it back for all these families. Joseph was giving them the money to ensure that they would be able to come back when they needed more. And what was their response to that? I mean, if you if you get home from the grocery store and you open up the grocery bag and there's all of your money that you just used to pay for the groceries. Would you be like, God, what are you trying to do to me here, <laughs> right? Either, some, either one or two things happened, right? Either somebody made a mistake or you've just gotten an incredible blessing from the Lord. But would your heart sink in great distress that God is just trying to do something terrible to your life? It's very odd that the brothers thought this. But you know what? We just talked about the fact that they've been going through all this guilt and carrying all this guilt. Here's what guilt does. Key thought, guilt turns blessings into distress. When something good happens, you can't even enjoy it because of the guilt that you're carrying inside of you. They couldn't enjoy this blessing from their brother. Why would Joseph want to bless them? This makes no sense. These guys, just they, they spoke terribly of him. They told him how much they didn't like him. They threw him in a cistern. They were going to kill him. I mean, they were talking about killing him and eventually just sold him into slavery. Why is it that Joseph would want to bless them? It's because we're going to get into this beautiful section, this theme of forgiveness. When we think about forgiveness, will you love someone that does wrong to you? You know what? It's really easy to love someone that loves you. It's really easy to love somebody who pats you on the back and gives you a compliment and says, man, you're, uh, you're my best friend. I love doing stuff with you. I love hanging out. That's an easy thing to do. That's an easy person to love. But it's difficult to do what? To love your enemy. When we're wronged, when we're betrayed, when we're criticized, we want to do anything but overlook the pain that we feel. But consider how God forgave us. While we were still his enemies, still sinning against him, what did he do? He sent his one and only son to die in our place. God went to incredible lengths to forgive us and to to give us this free gift to change our eternal trajectory, to go from a place of death unto life. Boy, that's a love that's really hard to understand. I think it's even hard to understand the forgiveness that Joseph had knowing what his brothers did to him. But that brings us to our life point this morning. Because God is sovereign, we can trust that choosing forgiveness will result in his healing, his restoration, and his purpose for our lives. And I think that fits so great with what we said earlier. You know, let God handle the problem people in your life. Don't defend yourself. Let God do those things. Instead, have the same heart, have the same attitude of forgiveness that God had when he said to us, I'm going to send my son down to this earth and take on the sins of this world. You know, Joseph shows us that sometimes Our purpose is found in learning to forgive someone who has wronged us. Our God is a God of reconciliation and peace, and therefore, we should be people that are marked by reconciliation and peace, even when we'd rather punish or ignore someone that hurt us, right? That's the easy thing. 
That's the natural thing to do. But God says, no, I don't want you to do what comes natural to you. Instead, I want to change your heart. I want to change you, and I want to fill you with my Holy Spirit so that it is me living through you. Because that's what will radically change the way that we respond to the world around us. It's the only way. You can try and modify your behavior, but that won't get you anywhere. It's only through God, the Holy Spirit, changing us from the inside out. There's a lot more to this story that we're going to finish up next week as we see this, uh, this conclusion to what's going to happen with these brothers and Joseph. And I'm very much looking forward to having you back next week. Um, a lot of great things happening this week. But just know that because God is sovereign, we can choose forgiveness in him and let his power work. It'll change us. It'll change others around us. Let's close in prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to give you praise today. Lord, because your word is just uh, so impactful, Lord, incredibly, um, Lord, uh, helpful in every aspect of our lives, Lord, as, as you teach us through your word, Lord, as, as you show us, um, Lord, how you want to work and move in our lives, Father, I just pray that through all of it, Lord, that we wouldn't quickly forget, but Lord, that instead we would take these principles, Lord, and that we would let you work and move in our lives so that, Lord, when people see us, what they'll experience is you living through us, Lord, your love flowing through us, Lord, your forgiveness, Lord, giving us the strength to be able to forgive others around us, Lord. What if a beautiful picture of how Joseph forgave his brothers even when they wanted to do nothing but harm him. And Lord, through all things, Lord, we've seen in this story that you take everything that we go through, Lord, and you turn it for good. And Lord, even when we can't see that on this side of the problems that we're facing, help us to trust, Lord, that you will take it and you will synergize it, Lord, and you will turn it for our good and you will use it for your glory. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Josh. Man, I love that. Letting God be our defense. Letting, trusting God to be our healer. And um, we sang songs earlier about God fighting our battles for us and, and not being people who are, are confrontational and, and, um, and they f fight and, and things. Let's be people who are truly reconciliated, rec uh, people of reconciliation and peace. That's what we need to be known as, uh, as believers in our world. So, some things I want to mention to you as you leave today. Tonight, uh, we have the Student Life Tailgate Party kickoff, fall kickoff. So, bring your, uh, your like, lawn chairs, wear your favorite jersey, uh, your colors. I can tell you which colors to wear if you want to come ask me. Um, but uh, we also have LifePoint Fall Festival coming up on October 5th. This is a wonderful time for, especially for the kids in our area, in our community. Bounce houses, special games, uh, candy, um, all kinds of different stuff happening on October 5th. So be thinking about who you can invite. Also, if you'd like to donate candy or, or cans of pop, we would love that. And so you can come and, um, and drop those off in our church kitchen. If you know where that's at, just drop those off on the counter in the church kitchen, kitchen, we would appreciate that. Also, Ladies Connection Point is starting up this week. Um, they are doing an awesome study on the book of Isaiah, and uh, I thought this was really cool, some of the, the titles, Trust God's Character, Trust God's Calendar, Trust God's Comfort, tr <coughs> Trust God's Commands, Trust God's Correction, Trust God's Coming, and uh, that's going to be a really great study. There are books uh, for sale, and I think some of you have already kind of uh, pre-registered, so your, your books are available today as you leave today. And also, just for everybody else, um, if you're not in a small group, a life group, we call them here, uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, it's a place to be um, connected to the body, to be encouraged, to uh, be accountable, and uh, to be just a, a group of people who will know you and know what your needs are and, and be able to pray, and, and you'll be able to encourage them as well. So let me know if you're interested in finding out more about small groups. Also, Baby Bottle Boomerang, that's coming. Uh, we have the, b the bottles out in the foyer today. You can take those, and it's a fundraiser for the Thrive Clinic here in Traverse City. So that is all I'm going to tell, tell you right now. 
We hope you have a wonderful week, and we hope we'll see you back here next Sunday. You're dismissed. Can it be?